You're listening to The Virtuous Mind, a podcast from Providence Christian College that discusses all facets of the human experience and the liberal arts from a biblical worldview. I'm your host, Dr. David E. Alexander. Where were you on 9-11? For Americans old enough to remember the horrific acts of terror committed on that dreadful day, the answer to that question is easy. Like the bombing of Pearl Harbor, 9-11 is a date that lives in infamy. The same can be said of October 7th, 2023, a day when more Jews were murdered than on any other day since the Holocaust. As many have noted, October 7th is Israel's 9-11 times 10. And like the infamous days mentioned earlier, October 7th started a new war, one which is part of an ongoing conflict between Israel, Hamas, and other terrorist groups in a concentrated region of the Middle East. Threatening to spill over into other countries near and far, This war has stimulated a variety of responses, some of which are shocking, yet sadly predictable. In this episode of The Virtuous Mind, I sit with Dr. Scott Swanson, professor of biblical and theological studies at Providence Christian College, to discuss what happened on October 7th, the history leading up to it, the ramifications of such an attack, and some of the challenges and complexities involved as we pray about the current crisis unfolding before us. Dr. Swanson, thank you for joining us today. I wish we were meeting under better circumstances, but I appreciate the time you're giving us. Yeah, thanks very much, David, for having me. Obviously, your knowledge, familiarity with Scripture, with the Old and New Testaments is relevant for the conversation today, but you have a lot more sort of personal connection. You've spent a significant amount of your life in Israel. So before we dive into the topic of the current escalation of violence, the current war in Israel, I'd love to hear, I think our audience would love to hear your familiarity with the place and the people. Yeah, for sure. Well, my wife is Jewish, and we've always had that connection. I was inspired while in seminary at Westminster in Philadelphia to pursue study of the Old Testament, especially the languages, the cognate languages to Hebrew and Aramaic in Israel. And that's what we did. Right after we got married, we hopped on a plane and went to Jerusalem. Mm. Then, of course, we made lots of friends there over the course of seven years that we lived there and maintained those contacts. That is both Jewish believers in Jesus, um, Jewish non-believers in Jesus, but Jewish believers in Jesus, as well as Palestinian Arab believers in Jesus. And that's part of our deep emotional tug of this whole thing is that God has his people there. I don't mean just Jewish people, but those who know him through Jesus, Mm. who are Jews and Arabs, Palestinians. And the struggle, this conflict cuts so deep that it cuts into the unity and fellowship that naturally is there, is meant to be there between us as different kinds of peoples, all peoples together in Christ and the Messiah. You also have some other connections. You have taken students from Providence Christian College to Israel for a couple of weeks. You did so very recently, just this last summer. Maybe describe that, what's involved. Maybe a few insights into your most recent trip there with a number of students. Yeah, this was our third trip that we've made with Providence students this past June. We've developed a pretty unique trip. It's not just biblical sites, but it's a holistic exploration of the whole land and the peoples there and the history, including the biblical history. This is the land in which most of the biblical story has taken place. That affects students just so deeply and emotionally and stays with them, and now they read the Bible differently. But the other thing that is also affecting students is 
they're getting to know people, the different kinds of people and the people that are Christians, Jewish Christians, Messianic believers, as well as Arab and Palestinian Christians, and their genuine commitment, devotion to the Lord, but yet having very different perspectives on the whole conflict and their history. Yet there's that Christian reality uniting us to different kinds of believers. We see that firsthand. On our first day, when we begin that morning, we go up the coast and stop at Caesarea by the sea, and then we go up to Haifa, where we meet with a pastor who is an Arabic pastor in Haifa of a Messianic Jewish congregation. Wow. His congregation is a Messianic Jewish congregation, Hebrew speaking. Haifa is a very mixed city in terms of Jewish and Arab. He doesn't see any conflict in that, and he is completely committed to the growth of their congregation as a Hebrew speaking Jewish congregation that also has others, Arabs as well, part of the congregation. That stays with students, and they keep a lot of these connections and pursue them after their trip. What does Paul say, right? Breaking down these walls of separation. Ephesians 2. Boy, that's an integrated congregation maybe unlike any other. Yeah, and we might have thought it was even impossible. Yeah. With God, things are possible. <laughs> yeah, amen. The violence that is pretty regular, perpetual in the Middle East, and especially between Israel and different portions of that land that are Palestinian, violence has escalated recently and significantly in ways that we actually haven't seen in a long, long time. Could you maybe just give us a rundown of when this started and you know, maybe some of the big events that have occurred, and then we can dive into some of the details as necessary. Yeah, it was a coordinated attack by the militant organization Hamas that runs Gaza, the Gaza Strip. That Gaza Strip then is surrounded by a lot of Israeli towns and villages and kibbutzim. Well, the plan was and succeeded in breaching the wall. There was a wall built up or a fence that at about maybe 20 different points at the same time was breached under cover of a massive missile attack that sends everybody on the other side into their safe rooms, their shelters, to be protected from the missiles, which was just a cover. And some of them might have even been dummy missiles, or much of them, a cover for this breach of the wall at many, many points through which somewhere between two and 3,000 armed terrorists and other civilians streamed through with a very deliberate goals and targets of the uh, surrounding population. And then they came through in trucks and motorcycles, and they headed for very specific targets that they knew about and had planned with very clear instructions of what they were to do. The main goal was to take as many hostages as possible and get them back into Gaza. From the perspective of this terrorist organization, it seems clear their top goal was to have hostages, kidnapped civilians, for the purpose of negotiating to get Hamas prisoners released from Israeli prisons. That was their top goal that supersedes any other concern for their own life and safety or the safety of any other Palestinians in Gaza. The secondary goal was to kill as many Jews as possible and in the most defiling and horrific ways. It was very deliberate and specific. We've been learning more. Stories come out every day of what happened. And by the way, this all started, it was the morning of Saturday, the Shabbat, the Sabbath, October 7th at 6.30, when it all started and very rapidly Hamas gained control. What they did depended on maybe which kind of group it was and how much time they had. Sometimes they would go and just murder young people, children, and old people, just to outright murder them as many as possible. And then to desecrate their bodies as much as they had time, they would spend time torturing before they killed them. In one village, their estimation was that 80% of the people that they found there dead had been tortured before they were killed. 10 or 15 children were tied up all together and then burned alive in the sight of their parents. And also they would do vice versa. Often when they killed people, they would shoot them in the face so much that they wouldn't be recognizable. Also raping and cutting off limbs or cutting off heads. A deliberate desecration because of their ideology that Jewish people were less than human. And that was the virtue in the sight of God to do that. This is Israel's 9-11, but so much more in so many ways uh, relative to the population. It's like, I don't know, people have estimated 10 9-11s. Uh, let me just summarize the numbers because these have kept changing. Uh, 1,400 Israelis of various kinds have been killed, including soldiers, civilians, men, women, old people, and children, even infants, and about 222 hostages that were taken back into Gaza 
including 30 children. And that 1,400 number, to be clear, that's 1,400 on the events of October 7th. Yes, that's correct. 1,400 verified. There are still hundreds of bodies that have not been identified. You know, my family is Jewish. So these events hit very, very close to home. When it comes to these sorts of things, whether you're a secular Jew, practicing Jew, a Messianic Jew, it impacts you in in ways. And I think a lot of that has to do with the history. I heard a quote the other day from Isaiah Berlin, famous Jewish philosopher, early part of the 20th century, I believe, where he defined being a Jew as being a people with a cognizant, always aware history. Being Jewish, you're constantly aware of the history. You're constantly, right? It's part of your entire year. A history with a place, Mm. especially. But I wanted to to mention an interesting thing that President Biden said in his first speech as he was reflecting on 50 years ago as a senator when he visited Israel. This was just before the Yom Kippur War, but understanding what Israel was facing and the hostile enemies on all its borders and the Prime Minister then, Golda Meir, uh, conversations that they had. And he recounted that she said to him, don't worry, Mr. Senator, uh, we have a secret weapon. It is that we have nowhere else to go. Hmm. This is something that every Israeli and most Jewish people, even not living in Israel, still feel about Israel. It's an expression you hear, Ein lanu eretz acheret. We don't have another land. Mm. This is our land. So the feeling of being so vulnerable in their land, which Israel has been so good about protecting that space for Israelis to be safe and secure in the land. And this then was violated in the most unimaginable way. The details of the attack, the background of it, all of that stuff is coming out minute by minute. One estimate is this was two years in the making. Over 500 Hamas soldiers had been training in Iran for the last two years up until September. Hamas, as well as I believe Islamic Jihad, were present for all of that training. Maybe this is a good time to sort of step back a little and think about the history here. Most of our listeners, I think, will be aware that the Jewish people have undergone persecution for really their entire history. They have been a people without a place for a significant amount of that history. The lengthiest time away from the land was when the Romans took it over, over 2,000 years ago. And then there was a dispersal, and Jews settled all over the world, quite prominently in European parts, and then inevitably persecutions executions, segregation, oppression of Jewish people happening all throughout those places where they inevitably settled. In the latter part of the 19th century, we get the Zionist movement. And maybe it's important to let people know, I think a lot of Christians don't realize the Zionist movement was actually a secular movement. This was, in many ways, if you read the literature on it, it was anti-religious. They were basically saying many of these uh, secular Jews had been experiencing throughout thousands of years this kind of persecution and uh, had, had started to have enough and want realized the desperate need for a homeland that they could protect. They could build up a military, a government. They reasoned to themselves that since God is not going to protect us because they were secular Jews, they they weren't necessarily, many of them agnostic, many of them even atheist, they started the Zionist movement so that they could do the protecting themselves. And that started in the 1880s. This is where you get something along the lines, I think, of about 10,000 or so Jews from largely Eastern Europe emigrate to Israel. My understanding is there had always been a Jewish presence in Israel during the thousands of years, but it was very small, 30 to 50,000 people max. Then in the 1880s, you get this first Zionist movement. Many make Aliyah, and they go to Israel to settle there. In a sense, I think that 1880, 1882 begins the more contemporary history that we're deeply embedded in now. Let me hand it over to you and maybe walk us through some of that. Well, if you talk to most Arabs and Palestinians, they would immediately tell you 
wait a minute, in your story there, you didn't mention that there was already people there. We're there and we have been there for generations. The perspective of most Arabs, Palestinians, is that this was a Western European imperialist colonization, invasion and takeover and stealing of the land. So that's the fundamental perspectival difference that then influences everything else. This was under the British Empire and it was called the British Mandate that was in control of the area. And there were Palestinian Arabs there, but very much of the land was undeveloped. Much of the land was owned by absent Arab landlords and poor Palestinian farmers farming that land. The land was acquired legally by those Arab landlords selling parcels to Jewish people. So there was established then a quite reasonably legally based increased Jewish presence in the land that then began to face more Arab opposition as it was growing and being more successful. As this was the introduction of a Jewish nationalist kind of sentiment, that actually was communicated to Palestinian people who began to have their own nationalist sentiment that they didn't particularly have before. Fair to them. They understood that this is their home for generations, but you know, to have their own nation idea, there began to be a lot of political and violent opposition to the continuation development of the Jewish presence there. And this happened throughout the British Mandate until after World War II. Britain had to get out. All the different circumstances that they were dismantling their empire as being part of it. So the situation was given to the hands of the United Nations, which then came to a decision by its authority, as much as it might have, to partition the land into two states, a Jewish state and Arab-Palestinian state. That Palestinian state, however, was at least for the most part, understood to be not locally Palestinian, but Jordan that was also considered Palestinian. Yeah, Transjordan, right? Yeah. And then the, eventually the, Jordan. Yeah. yeah. And so there was that idea of partition, which then picked a line based on where most of the settlement was, not entirely consistently because it was mixed all the way throughout, but where most of the Jewish settlement was or most of the Arab-Palestinian settlement was, and the line was drawn. Neither side was satisfied with the line. Jewish people were not, but they agreed. We will accept this partition. Because uh, stepping back, I think you have to just honestly, historically look that this Jewish immigration Zionist movement did not, except for a very minuscule, if nothing originally, minority that were extremists that really believed we should kick out Arab people from this whole area. But rather, this is a land that has Arabs and we have to live in peace with them. There are two peoples here. Again, from this secular Zionist movement was always recognized, and it was never a goal to be, or even think it was possible to do anything other than have two peoples that were sharing the land. The Jewish people in various ways were not satisfied with this division. They accepted it, that they would abide by it, and immediately it was rejected by the Arab powers. And there began a civil war. <laughs> for the territory. 1947 was that UN partition plan. 1948, Israel declares its independence in the midst of a civil war for the territory. But that battle, the first stage was kind of a civil war locally, but the battle was then intensified when all the surrounding Arab nations declared war on the new state. On the day yeah. of Israel's declaration yeah, of independence. the next day. That's what they were faced with, and then there was the war, the war for independence, in which they, it was complete refusal from the other side to abide by anything, any kind of compromise. Israel they won the war by securing this land similar to uh, UN partition borders, but they gained a little bit more. And the end of the war was simply, we'll stop here, the armistice line, we'll declare a peace at the line as far as we got, or as far as the Arabs are, and stop there. And that determined the line, the border, until 1967. So that was the land of Israel. And the parts that were Palestinian Arab were never independently Palestinian, but were occupied by Egypt or Gaza and Jordan for the West Bank and then northern parts of Galilee by Syria. So there was not independence. There was the UN Secretary General just made a statement that uh, this war, that this attack didn't come in a vacuum. Right. Arab peoples, the Palestinians suffering for, what did he say, 56 years, that is 1967, suffering yeah. occupation, a yeah. cruel occupation. 
um, they were occupied before that as well, but by Arab countries. I do want to back up just a little bit, just to go over some of the, the history you recounted very, very nicely. So we've got the sort of Zionist movement begins in 1882. It is a, a secular movement. It is not a religious movement. This is not religious Jews going to Israel because they think doing so will usher in the Messiah or something like that. So they're going there really so that they can be a people with a place because of intensified persecution of Jews, primarily in Eastern Europe, even in Russia and some of those other places. So you get 10,000 people who emigrate to Israel, that land, Palestine, in 1882. From there, right? And at that time, it's actually under the control of the Ottoman Empire. And so until about 1917, and the British come in, and the British end up taking it over, and they realize very quickly that this is a tinderbox, right? This is a mess. They do not want to be in charge of this place. So you have the Balfour Declaration that happens in 1917. And, and this ends up becoming, if I'm not mistaken, this ends up becoming international law, right? Where you have the beginnings of the two-state solution. You have land that is dedicated now, according to international law, whatever that means, for Israeli settlers. And so that then adds a number of new new Jews from all over the world come then, you know, fast forward, persecution of Jews is increasing still all over the world, and especially in Europe. And then in 1937, right, you have the Peel Commission. The Peel Commission comes in, and they then formally propose the two-state solution, right? And so the idea was this. Look, how many Jews are in Israel around this time, right? Hundreds of thousands now. Jews are going to live here for a long time. And they're going to maybe create a nation. And so nationhood begins to sort of occupy the minds, understandably, totally understandably, I think, by the Arab occupants of that same land. Fast forward, 1937, you have the Peel Commission. The Peel Commission comes in and says, look, either this becomes a completely Arab nation, a completely Arab occupied land, in which case we have to transfer all of the Jews out of here to another location. That doesn't look feasible. And that looks, the Jews are just back in the same situation they were in with all the pogroms and persecutions in Eastern Europe. That's off the table. Or we make this a completely Jewish-occupied land. Well, that doesn't look feasible, right? You've got lots and lots of Arabs who've been there for a very, very long time. A one-state solution doesn't look feasible either because that will just actually make it de facto a completely Arab-occupied land and the Jews will end up being removed because we know that the Muslims that were there at the time and continue, of course, to be there, not all, but many of them are not satisfied with having any Jews living in that region whatsoever. So a one-state solution looks identical to a completely Arab-occupied region of the world. So you get the two-state solution. First really formally proposed in 1937 Peel Commission and endorsed by the Wilsonian government and then also endorsed by Congress, endorsed by, again, international law, Winston Churchill. I mean, you get everybody. And so already in 1947, you get the UN resolution that ends up becoming ratified by the entire United Nations. So that's where we're at. There were skirmishes. There were battles happening all throughout this. This is why the British didn't want to be there and recognize this is not a viable solution for the British to be in charge of this from 1917 all the way until they hand it over in 1947. They want the heck out of this place. So, And part of the reason they want the heck out is because there's lots and lots of battles happening all between that. Israel, as a nation, is committed to being a Jewish state. That is to exist for the purpose of Jews living there and being able to come from all over the world where they've been exiled to return to their land as their land. Yet from the beginning, from the Declaration of Independence, it has been a Jewish state with a significant and other minority. In fact, it's something like 20% of Israel itself, not talking about occupied territories, but Israel itself that is Arab. And the commitment of the new nation of Israel from the beginning was to be a democratic nation in which minorities, Arab minorities, would have human rights, uh, would have their rights in the state, and even the right to vote and have representation in the parliament, their Knesset. And that continues to this day. It's been very, very imperfectly realized. And so there's significant lack of justice and recognition of rights of those minorities. But many, if not most Israelis, are also concerned about that. But 
then because of Israel's need and recognition from the beginning that they were in this land to have to share it with the Arab occupants outside those borders, and that when 1967 brought suddenly all this territory into Israel as an occupied territory, not taken into the actual borders of the country, but as an occupied territory, they could not just be integrated into the country, like even if that many more extreme might want to, because that would be the influx of too much of a non-Jewish population to be able to at the same time be democratic and yet be a Jewish state. So it's never really been an option to like just take it over with the local Palestinian Arab population. I think there's always been a movement to try to get to peace with Palestinians. And what was happening actually in the 1980s and the 1990s was significant progress more than has ever been and ever since towards some kind of at least a framework called the Oslo Accords were a framework for an eventual two-state solution. And that progress was really significant, especially a turning point was when Yasser Arafat, the leader of the PLO, renounced terrorism. And you have the famous handshake on the White House lawn with uh, Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat. And there, there were many more extreme Israelis who were not happy about this and that were conceding too much. But on the Arab-Palestinian side, it was also seen to be too much concession. So parallel with Arafat himself renouncing terrorism was the creation of Hamas which was created in 1988, now with the influence of radical, militant Islam, jihadist kind of Islam. And this is normative Islam. It's like a new, radical, militant, aimed at having, as we've known with the Islamic State, their own Islamic State under Sharia law that they are ruling. It still exists as the charter of Hamas since they were formed in 1988, that it is a sacred right of Palestinians, Muslims, to own this land, all of it, for themselves, and therefore to kill and expel Jews from all of it. There's also a parallel propaganda campaign that Hamas has run since then to try to obfuscate those goals and say, well, we're actually moderate and we would be happy with the two-state solution, but then they immediately, and they have to say this for their more radical elements, but that would only be temporary, and we have not changed our goal, that absolute commitment to an Islamic state in all of Palestine, and uh, that's really never been renounced. So two-state solution is not a Hamas solution. It's really not a solution of any of the Islamic militant groups. Right, Islamic occupy, Jihad in some uh, ways even more radical. Hezbollah, yeah. uh, none of them. Uh, these are groups that are backed by Iran. Iran represents one particular interpretation of Islam. Another sort of interesting thing to consider here is that when Israel started normalizing relationships with Egypt and becoming more and more friendly with Egypt economically, more and more normalization of the relationship between Israel and Egypt in terms of trade yeah. and economic relations and, and yes. more and more intensification of that. With, with Egypt and Jordan, they have formal peace treaties. And what, what did you see as those things were becoming more and more likely, you saw an escalation of violence? So now recently, the movement towards normalization was Saudi Arabia. With Saudi Arabia, yeah. that's right. And so as Israel becomes more and more friendly, peace treaties, more and more economic relationships between Israel and Saudi Arabia, you see an escalation in violence. And of course, the sort of sworn enemy of Saudi Arabia in the Muslim world is Iran. And Iran are the financial and even military backers of these Islamic militants. So there is a sort of background narrative that I think has some explanatory value for what we're seeing right now. Yeah, the additional complexities and layers on that now is that Iran being the financer of all these Islamist terrorist groups, they're now also the financer of Russia. And Russia needs Iran's support to continue its war against Ukraine. And so it's looking like what President Biden said, an inflection point in history, uh, this alignment of powers against each other on both sides. And, and the U.S. is involved now of necessity, at the very least because of that broader background. I don't think, you know, neither you nor I thinks, of course, that Israel is perfectly innocent in everything that they do and all of the policies that the Israeli government establishes and enacts are, you know, perfect. And Yeah, of course, but we do have to say that. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it and we have to. Yes. That, that's right, that's right. <laughs> Not only is there an escalation of violence in Israel right now, there's a war being waged. Israelis, Jews in Israel are undergoing you know, this constant bombardment 
there's also a massive increase in anti-Semitism all over the world right now. What's going on? It is it is all over the world. And this is something I teach our students here who are sometimes unaware of the history of this and the extent of it even in the world today and the increase in it so that now just ordinary synagogues, temples have to have security in this country and in Europe and attacks happen just because they're Jews. So it's a very unfortunate history in terms of Christian history that is Christians themselves over centuries contributed to anti-Semitic hatred and violence attacks against Jewish people simply because they were Jewish. The Christian world, the legitimately Christian world now has renounced that, but it is still part of our history. And so we have to acknowledge it and show how we're different. And that, in fact, I would contend that there's still something to the promises God made to Abraham that those who bless you will be blessed, that those who bless the Jewish people, which does not mean, of course, uh, unqualified support of whatever Israel does, but Jewish people as Jewish. It sometimes seems incomprehensible, although increasingly we see evidence of it. It otherwise seem to be an irrational hatred of Jewish people as Jewish. If you want to see uh, one of the clearest examples of that in our Old Testament, in the Bible, read the story of Esther. As Jewish people are then in exile out of the land, they're living in exile in Persia, and this attempt, this irrational hatred of these Jewish people because they're Jewish, and the attempt to destroy them. I think this is understood to be a demonic and satanically originated thing, as particularly God's people. God's people are now also Christians that Satan is is concerned to bring down, but still also Jewish people as Jewish. We see it in our country now, of course, the Holocaust was an expression of this. Even before World War II and then during and after in the land of Israel and in the surrounding Arab nations, anti-Semitism has been a growing feature. And so uh, it is remarkable that it is not pervasive everywhere and that many Arabs and Palestinians do not have anti-Semitic hatred. But what radical Islam is... <laughs> It has incorporated anti-Semitism into its character, what it stands for in its existence. You can go back to the 1988 Hamas Charter. They even reference the protocols of the elders of Zion yeah. and repeat many Nazi tropes. They are dedicated to as part of their religious zeal for their religion and the establishment of an Islamic state in Palestine is killing Jews. I'd like to read something that's uh, it's hard to read. It was an intercepted conversation between a Hamas militant on October 7th and his parents that he had called them. <clears throat> Let's see if I can read it. Hi, Dad. I'm speaking to you from Mephalsim. Militant is heard saying excitedly, open your WhatsApp and look at the killed, that is the Israelis, look at how many I killed with my own hands. Your son killed Jews. My hands are colored with their blood. Dad, I am speaking to you from a Jewess's phone. I killed her and her husband. I killed ten with my own hands, the terrorist told his Gazan parents. He went on to make a video call so his dad could see the massacre committed by his son, a member of Hamas's Nukba forces. May God protect you, my son, his father said, weeping for joy. His mother said, I wish I was there with you, as her son is heard shouting directions at fellow terrorists, kill, 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 kill them. When uh, the uh, uh, historians have looked back at uh, the Nazi uprising, the Nazis and their uh, persecution of Jews, uh, a theme that emerges fairly common amongst them is that in order for them to carry out their attacks, they have to see the Jewish people as non-human. And so there's a diary entry by a Nazi, I tell students about this regularly, where he sees this little girl running across a field in a concentration camp, and he immediately recalls his daughter and brings a smile to his face. And in the diary, he says that uh, he had to remind himself, he had to sort of come to his senses and remind himself that he was not looking at a, a being that is as human as his daughter. And so I think there is something, in order to carry out these kinds of things, in order to say what you just read, you have to see this other, th these, these other people as non-people. You have to see them as non-humans. Uh, and that's what we have happening here. May God not allow us to ever do this. I do want to say this. I don't want to see Palestinians. I don't want to see others as non-human. I want to watch over my heart. Please pray and watch over the heart of all people. Can I say, too, what Israel is doing now 
much of the media is falling prey to Hamas's own propaganda in yep. this, which they want to get on camera children collateral damage from Israel's attacks. When Hamas attacked, they deliberately targeted civilians. When Israel attacks, they tell civilians beforehand to get out, and they never directly target, contrary to propaganda, what you may hear otherwise, they never directly target civilians. They very precision missiles that they use, and they target Hamas facilities and any Hamas operatives or militants that they can. Unfortunately, Hamas holds the population in Gaza hostage and hides behind them and puts their bases and missile launching facilities next to hospitals and schools and civilian homes. That's what they do. And so Israel is in this really difficult position of needing to destroy Hamas, this threat to their existence on their border, at the same time not to simply accept any level of civilian casualties. And they don't. And that's why it, it's so hard. If you just want to wipe out the whole civilian population to solve the problem, it would not be great risk to Israel's uh, military. But they won't do that. They have repeatedly told in the last two weeks the civilian population to move south to the southern half of Gaza, where the focus of Israel's attack is ground attack is going to be for the Hamas tunnels underground in mostly that northern part. It's called the uh, Hamas Metro. It's this intricate web of tunnels and where hostages also are being kept. That's what why they have to go in in a ground attack. So they have repeatedly warned and they repeat it. And also propaganda comes back saying, oh, there is no place for them to go. And we can see there is evidence that United Nations and other help that is coming in is establishing tents places for them to go. There is more place for them to go with food and water and medicine that's been brought in from Egypt for them to be able to survive outside their homes in the south part so that they're not at risk because of Israel's attack. That's what Israel wants. But what does Hamas do? It blocks the roads right. to the southern part of Gaza. It tells the, the local population not to give in to that propaganda from Israel and stay where you are and tries as much as it can to keep the civilian population there so they can use it as a shield and also broadcast what they're presenting as the inhumanity of Israel. The ground attack in Gaza, which seems to be necessary in order to root them out, has been delayed and delayed and delayed in order to attempt the safe passage, the protection of Palestinian civilians. It's very difficult for me to remember and imagine another nation that has gone to so much trouble to protect the civilians when a recognized government, right? Hamas is actually the political authority of Gaza, voted in whether it was a fair democratic election, all of that stuff. But when one nation was is being attacked by another entity and then goes to these kinds of lengths in order to greatly reduce and even attempt to eliminate any kind of civilian casualties, I mean... I have difficulty recalling any other nation that's gone to these kinds of lengths. Yeah, it, it would be and is, according to the rules of war, the responsibility of a nation to protect its civilian population. And, Hamas and not is, use them as human shields. Yeah, Hamas is doing the opposite. One last thing here, Scott. What we're seeing in the United States and in uh, some of the media and in some of the, uh, maybe especially on university and college campuses, all sorts of protests in favor of Palestinians and protests even in favor of Hamas. The Hamas flag being flown and waved in many of these protests in Times Square, in London, in Harvard. Those are the prominent ones. They're happening actually all over. And in many cases, you know, the ones that stick out to me, given our vocation, are the ones that are happening on college and university campuses all over the country. What, what's going on? It's very scary and so disturbing that kind of understandably because of Palestinian situation and also the media and propaganda, they're subjected to not be able to admit any difference between the terrorist activities that are determining Palestinians' existence and legitimate Palestinian rights. I want to be pro-Palestinian as I am pro-Israeli. We have Palestinian friends and we cry for them. And now, Christian Palestinians uh, that are quite a minority and persecuted minority in their own Palestinian area. 
but they're they're under this too. Many of these Palestinian friends we also cry about are understandably because of their situation to a certain extent unable to concede that this is beyond the pale and to distinguish legitimate Palestinian dignity and rights and aspirations to distinguish that from this radical jihadist organization and its terror activities that, that they can't even recognize that. And and so then it's part of a propaganda campaign that is motivating a lot of this. And so uh, a not clear understanding, but it's also the anti-Semitism that is in this country and, uh, and, and very sad. And we know that there are Palestinians and Arabs that do condemn such violence and, and terrorist activities. And uh, I, I wish more of them could have the courage to do that, though, and to recognize that Israel has a just cause here. Many do, but more need to. And that is their own interests for their own rights in the future as well. Well, Scott, I think that's a good place for us to wrap up. I hope and pray that we don't need to do this again. May the Lord bless. May the Lord put an end to this. And uh, may the Lord continue to protect all innocents all over the world, and especially right now in Israel. Amen. You've been listening to The Virtuous Mind, a podcast from Providence Christian College. The mission of Providence Christian College as a reformed Christian institution is to equip students to be firmly grounded in biblical truth, thoroughly educated in the liberal arts, and fully engaged in their church, their community, and the world for the glory of God and for service to humanity. We'd love to have you visit our campus. Providence Christian College is now accepting applications for the upcoming semester. Contact an admissions counselor to learn more. Visit providencecc.edu.